Hi, well, thank you, Stephen. Thanks to everyone for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and so very quickly, I will just um, mention to everyone listening that ITS America, our members include public agencies, departments of transportation, transit agencies, um, and more, as well as the private sector uh, companies that are developing these solutions and technologies and research and academia. So uh, when, I'm gonna talk about a couple examples here. Um, that are public agencies who are using some of these solutions uh, in, in support of their policy goals. Um, so, so really, you know, what, what public agencies are looking for are these tools and solutions, as you said, that are going to help deliver cleaner, safer, more accessible mobility options for their residents. Uh, you know, they are trying to solve for cleaner air in certain communities. They are trying to solve for um, more dangerous, uh, uh, ameliorating more dangerous intersections um, and, and, um, roadway quarters, um, and they're trying to solve for um, improving access for those who might be using active mobility, for those who may not have access to, uh, you know, uh, transit infrastructure and, and such. And so one example I'll share is um, New York City DOT, uh, who's a member, they use their ITS infrastructure and the data that they got from all of their existing um, digital infrastructure through ITS um, deployments to actually determine that they could take a lane from the Brooklyn Bridge uh, and convert it to a protected um, bike and um, pedestrian pathway without harming vehicular traffic on that bridge. And as a result, they were able to create that protected environment for active mobility and increase uh, walking and biking by about 80%. And so that's an example of how uh, an agency is using these technologies to advance some of their goals. And then a, a, another quick example um, is um, Los Angeles DOT has used open source um, code and software and APIs um, to uh, advance some of their policy goals. So one of their goals is clean, cleaner air for communities. So they are using open APIs to create um, zero emission delivery zones in certain areas of the cities. So they are able to use these tools to manage their infrastructure in a more dynamic and nimble way that allows them um, to deliver the benefits that they're seeking to communities. I'll stop there, Stephen, um, uh, as I know that went a little long. No, uh, a lot of the interesting questions. I want to come back to you, Laura, after we talk to others, maybe talk to others as well about uh, the role of the city as an API provider, right? Let's think about the function of the city or the state, what it can do. Egan, let's go over to you for a second and, and follow on the same theme. So we, we have digital infrastructure, perhaps in how we use data, but we also have digital infrastructure in embedding it in new construction and old construction, right? The role of digital infrastructure to uh, extend and make more usable the existing transportation uh, methods and its equity. Would you comment on how you're thinking about that at USDOT, please? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that USDOT, uh, I'm in the uh, Intelligent Transportation System Joint Program Office. Uh, we work closely with ITS America too as well. And, but when I think of uh, digital infrastructure, uh, I think of it as the data and the digitization of the infrastructure. It's the, so it's both those and that digital transformation that really leads to providing an opportunity for technology, uh, for the technology layer to be part and parcel of that solution. Uh, for example, efforts in my office, uh, we engage in uh, to get full uh, what we call full intelligent transportation system life cycle leadership uh, in solving transportation problems worth solving uh, using technology. Some of the previous uh, uh, speakers mentioned about, you know, it's, it's not about the technology, it's about solving the problems worth solving. Uh, the technology is sort of a tool for us. So, for example, uh, we look at connectivity uh, between the elements of uh, uh, systems and travelers. Uh, automation, uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and the internet of things all fit into that innovative uh, technology solution and uh, a few more things, uh, electri uh, you know, electrification. Uh, I anticipate folks like us uh, with this interest in digital infrastructure uh, will help identify ways for the transportation system to deliver on uh, solutions that take advantage of uh, innovative technology. 
a few weeks ago, I'll just use this quick example. A few weeks ago, the department uh, hosted uh, 600 participants in a vehicle to everything uh, communication summit at the DOT. Uh, we had like uh, about 25% of the participants were in person. Uh, representatives from NTIA, FCC, NTSB, OEMs, IOOs, uh, ITS America, Auto, Innovation, uh, Auto Innovators, uh, Ashto, Academia, and state and local governments, of course. So it's a whole big smorgasbord of folks having this sort of conversation, similar to what we're having here now, and uh, both uh, data uh, to listen and both uh, there to also provide uh, updates on vehicle to everything and testing and deployment uh, from department leadership, uh, multimodal technical teams uh, leading these conversations on VDAX deployment. And that's a big part of this digital infrastructure strategy that we see. It's taking that information, but being able to really address how do we help solve the problems worth solving. Uh, attendees sat in on a number of uh, breakout discussions too as well, both live and virtually. And uh, some of the key takeaways that we took away from that conversation was we need to have more of these type of conversations to really maintain that direction uh, with uh, you know, uh, these, these multiple teams thinking about how we take advantage of what's coming out now over the next five years. Remember the bill is not just a one year deal, it's over the next five years, how can we keep building on these uh, technology solutions that can help solve these problems with solving that folks are trying to uh, get at. And uh, we think- what, about, you know, what a quick question before we go to Vikram next. Uh, um, first of all, I can tell you're a federal official because you use more acronyms in one sentence than <laughs> I've ever heard before. So I, I, you, you've established your credentials. Um, real quick question. If we thought about digital, and then Vikram, then you're next. If we thought about digital infrastructure, one could think about it in terms of extending the life cycle of physical infrastructure, or you could think about it in terms of knowing enough about utilization that you're able to actually change the, the usage and the planning and the allocation of physical infrastructure, think curbs and sidewalks, et cetera. And your department at DOT, which are both of those ways are you considering it? It, it's it's uh, actually both uh, thinking about how we change the utilization of the infrastructure to address the needs and uh, some of the previous speakers mentioned that too as well, taking advantage of the existing system that we have to extend the capabilities that are available to uh, this uh, digital infrastructure, collecting the data. Uh, the previous speaker spoke about uh, having the data to make decisions that can lead to addressing safety issues, for example, identifying where the hotspots are. So there's a, a lot of uh, that sort of thinking that comes out of uh, this digital infrastructure opportunity. Uh, and I sat in on previous conversations, folks were utilizing the technology that's actually coming out of automation. Uh, uh, you have LIDAR that is being utilized now for actually mapping out and looking at the vulnerable road users and trying to address those issues. So there's a lot of these sort of opportunities that we're trying to get behind and get uh, folks engaged on. Thank you very much. Vikram, um, so this is a friendly question. You manage a really old system and um, those old systems have been historically starved for capital investment. But if you thought about digital, I know you're working on fair systems. If you thought about digital solutions, uh, how are you making the, how are you using those digital solutions to make the experience of the customer better, right? As contrasted to make the experience of the department better. Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, we, we are the oldest transit agency in the United States, right? We, we have significant amount of legacy infrastructure and obviously digital transformation allows us to get to our, you know, priority goals faster, right? Like safety, reliability, um, you know, equity and such. So to, so to your specific question, uh, you know, digitization allows us to inform our riders, which is the most important thing, right? So there's not only trip planning, but also service interruptions or, you know, whenever we are replacing assets, informing our riders of what we intend to do. So those are the, so that's the, from a rider perspective, that's the most important thing in, in allowing better trip planning, right? And, and then obviously working on, 
improving our, you know, uh, the frequency of service and the reliability of service, so on and so forth. But again, informing riders is, is the single biggest thing when it comes to uh, improving ridership experience. And then your work in uh, digital infrastructure, how are you, how are you thinking about uh, a fair, you, you have an interesting title because you're probably the only person in America that has a title that has fair in it, but it's F-A-R-E. So how are you thinking about F-A-I-R fares in respect to F-A-R-E's fares? Yes, that's a great question. So, you know, through through the current large project that I'm managing, which is a, a billion dollar public-private partnership uh, program that allows us to upgrade our in our entire legacy fare system that includes fare vending machines, fare gates, uh, fare verification devices, and also improving, uh, you know, the Charlie card, the card we use to travel. And uh, we are also developing an open and closed loop system. So, uh, you know, it allows us to provide a significant amount of policy flexibility, which we currently don't have with our legacy system. We can you know, experiment with fares, we can do fare capping, we can do income-based fares. So uh, so we can truly be FAIR fare as we are managing FARE fares, right? We are, are while, uh, you know, revenue collection is, is important for us because it, it is supposed to pay for about 40% of our operating revenue, but it is also, uh, you know, we don't exist to, to collect fares, we exist to provide service. Right. So so that's the fundamental driver of, of what we do. But again, you know, having access to data on our riders and our the needs of our riders, the OND information, the you know, um, other special needs. Right. There we have a ton of reduced fares uh, riders. We have uh, seniors, we have students, we have people with disabilities. So we serve a lot of different types of riders that we want to cater to. And this allows us. The, the modern system allows us to cater to them while we cater to folks who want to come attend events in, in greater Boston, right? But our, our core ridership is from for our riders. Our, our the great are, answer, except that you, in your list of riders, there was no reference to Harvard employees at all. So we get a discount of any sort? Uh, we do, we do. There, there are there are uh, there are a lot of uh, you know uh, arrangements with uh, different institutions. So. With Harvard, with MIT, with with other large area employers, there are uh, significant relationships okay. that we have. So we have institutional fares in addition to these other reduced sure. fares as well. Um, Tim, uh, I have a question for you, and then a follow up to Laura. So you've got an interesting background because you have a McKinsey background, but you also have been working on uh, digital transformation, the digital sm uh, smart cities works venture studio. So I want to focus the question this way. Um, I think one of the challenges here is imagination and innovation, right? The, the world has changed so much, but procurement and traditional policies have not. So as you think about the opportunities of, and the barriers, which is Laura, why I want to move to you after Tim, but if you think about the opportunities for entrepreneurial companies to provide innovation, how do we get government to ask the right questions that allow the companies to provide the right solutions? Well, Stephen, it's an interesting issue. You know, when you look at the global construction industry, uh, it represents about 13% of global GDP. So it's one of the largest ecosystems in the world. However, our industry has had the lowest level of investment in research and development and technology than any other industry. This has yielded uh, the lowest levels of productivity. Productivity has been flat in the United States since World War II because agencies, government agencies, policies, investment uh, have not advanced properly. Uh, when I was at McKinsey, we published uh, the study called Reinventing Construction that said that the greatest opportunity set for improving performance is adoption of a digital strategy and digital solutions. Yet KPMG did a study that said 74% of the companies of engineering companies and construction companies don't have a digital strategy or any kind of innovation strategy. So it's just not part of the ecosystem. What we've seen over the last three to five years, we've now seen about 30 to $40 billion being poured into contact startups, uh, tech companies, 
accelerators, incubators. And as you reference in our Smart City Works Venture Studio, we've partnered with public agencies like New Jersey Transit, uh, private corporations like WGI, like Parsons and others to adopt technology solutions aimed at those agencies and the solution sets around a more sustainable environment. And I think the, the companies that have adopted those digital solutions have seen immediate benefits and immediate improvements in terms of project performance, but also economic performance. So, um, I mean, Kim, I may come back in a second. Laura, um, uh, you have everybody that belongs to your organization, public, private, government. Um, how do we, how do we, what are the barriers to digital infrastructure, A, and B, how do we get the government, maybe Egan to you next on this, how do we get government to issue uh, RFPs fast enough and open enough that they're buying innovation, not just buying asphalt or concrete or fill in the blank? What, how do we change and modify the barriers to that? So Stephen, that's a great question. Um, I have a couple of answers and I will say, I'll preface this with, we work really closely with Egan and he's been a great partner. And I, and I think that, you know, and there are many things that we're hopeful that we're working with USDOT on. Um, so first I will say funding, the way that we fund infrastructure is very much, um, it's very much targeted to physical infrastructure to your point. But digital infrastructure and technology have different needs, and that needs to be addressed in the funding. Um, and for example, um, we have we have actually requested from USDOT that operation and maintenance for technology should be a part of the funding in many of these um, new grant programs. Again, because the technology needs are very different than the needs of a physical infrastructure. So there's the funding side, and then of course the procurement side, uh, which, as you mentioned, is very hard. Um, right now to, to, to cure innovative technology because it's, most agencies essentially have to predetermine what solution they need and then and issue an RFI or RFP um, as opposed to being able to um, really solve for the problem they have, not knowing which technology solution might be the right one. And so there are ways that public agencies have created innovation offices and created new procurement models um, to address that, but it's still, I'd say, the exception rather than the rule. Um, so that those are some barriers. Another um, barrier I would describe is that we don't have a national strategy for a phased uh, national approach to digital infrastructure, and that's something that we're working closely with Egan and other partners on. I think there's a great desire to collectively develop that so that we don't just have these pockets of innovation in certain areas, because I do want to say, you know, our members are actually deploying these technologies. There are there there is a digital infrastructure um, layer that is being deployed, but not everywhere. And that's what we want to assure is that it is ubiquitous. I mean, and the final challenge I will mention is not a, a technical challenge in that sense, which is people don't see and understand this technology and the benefits. And I'll say as a mother, I know that I want my children to be safer when they walk or ride their bikes to school. What I don't know and what I don't understand is how this digital infrastructure layer, the data that Egan talked about, can be used by my local department of transportation to identify uh, a safety risk and then address it in my own community. So these tools are essential to creating the type of communities that we all want to live in, but people don't understand it, so they don't ask for it. So they're asking for you to fix the physical infrastructure what we really need to be doing is communicating the power of this digital layer that can actually help with all of these challenges that we're trying to solve and opportunities that exist. Egan, let me ask a question. Let me try to ask a coherent question. I, 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 um, it may not be perfect. So in, back when I was mayor, even when I was deputy mayor, um, FTA bus funding, transit purchases, fixed routes, very inflexible stuff, right? Not, not dynamic at all. So you could take that issue of kind of modes of transportation. Now we're talking about mobility, right? Instead of a mode, we're talking about mobility. How do you use, uh, how are you thinking about funding digital infrastructure that allows you better understanding of the behavioral characteristics of a system, right? In order to modify it dynamically to fit the needs of the customer. So, Think about all the data we have, cell phone data, usage data, the data that uh, Vikram has in his system from fare cards. 
How should we be using that or thinking about that to change the behavioral characteristics? So, um, uh, to go back to the last question and to include this uh, question too as well, I think to build on Laura's point, it's how do we start to identify digital infrastructure as part of the infrastructure conversation so that the planning process actually starts to look at these as viable solutions. One of the previous uh, speakers was talking about the planning process and that's a critical element of making these decisions on the funding side. Uh, you know, the, uh, the federal funding comes out uh, annually and uh, you know we do have a bill that has a lot of more funding now, but typically what we need to do is uh, figure out how we get uh, digital infrastructure and these solutions, these problems worth solving to be part of that conversation so that it's planned for not just uh, from a one-time uh, you know, one solution, but a continual uh, stream of funding to address these issues and to keep them in, to keep the technology solutions in place so that uh, we are continually funding them and it becomes part and parcel of the solutions that uh, Laura spoke about that folks don't typically know about because it's not part of the conversation. So that's why I mentioned in my uh, earlier conversation is these sessions that we're having here, we need to build on them to have that sort of conversation so that we can impact uh, the funding streams that are coming out of uh, USDOT, not just the FTA, but the other funding streams too as well. There's, a, there's uh, you know, uh, billions of dollars coming out on an annual basis that need to be impacted by uh, us being part of that conversation on the digital infrastructure side. So, um... I'm gonna, we got about seven minutes. I'm going to close with Deacon, but let me ask Vikram, Tim, and Laura uh, the following question. So let's assume you've got more money than you've ever had before, and you're going to use digital infrastructure to make a meaningful difference in equity and sustainability. Where are you going to start? Vikram first, then Tim, and then Laura. Well, it's, it, it's, a, it's a complex question and a complex answer i but if let's say you know i had all the information and everything that i needed to do i would probably start with um you know sustainability and and moving towards more um you know uh, electrification of our fleet just given where we are obviously safety is something we are already making significant investments on and we continue to improve our our safety issues and that's something you know, we, we are already getting funding for, and obviously that, that's a challenge that we are we are all addressing every day. So, you know, I would say sustainability and electrification, and then obviously equity as well, right? And and again, we're doing a lot of work in equity, but I think where, where we are not doing what we should be doing a lot more on is, is electrification, because we are one of the largest contributors to, um, to emissions in, in the state. Thanks. Tim, digital uh, solutions and technologies, which are going to be the most transformative? Uh, the, I think there's two. I think data analytics or predictive analytics probably is one. Uh, if you look, you know, FMI and Autodesk did a great study that said that we're talking about infrastructure projects here. They said for a billion dollar infrastructure project on average, there's 130 million emails, 55 million documents, 12 million workflows, and 96% of all that data that gets captured goes unused. It costs about 1.8 to $2 billion worth of bad decision making. So I think predictive analytics is key. The one that I'm very excited about is decarbonization strategies. Um, 39% of the world's carbon emissions come from the built environment and the construction process. 25% of that is embodied carbon coming from construction itself. Uh, what we did here at Columbia University in conjunction with Turner and Townsend, we developed what we call the net zero scorecard that enables a project to calculate how much carbon emissions are being generated so that you can then attack the top 10 list and decrease that amount of carbon generation in a very quantifiable measure. So I think that has, from an equity standpoint, I think that has a great opportunity. Laura, same question. And you're, let's say you're speaking to your entire membership and you're trying to catalyze action. Where would you start and uh, with what digital solution? 
Well, I mean, I think that uh, I, I do think that data, data analytics, the ability to turn that data into insights is is really important. Um, but I think, you know, I was thinking about your question that, that you asked to Vikram and, and to Tim, and I think where we actually start, because we have such a broad membership, right, we have transit agencies, we have cities, we have states, we have regional uh, MPOs, is what, what we are, we start is you need to involve your community in solving for the problems. So you need to find out what the community wants. You need to involve them in um, having that discussion about what are your top challenges um, in mobility? You know, is it safety? Is it is it having cleaner air? Is it ac equitable access? It's gonna differ for different communities. You know, we have, we have cities like Los Angeles uh, that's very spread out. Uh, you know, we have states like Texas that have urban areas and then the, the most rural roads in the country. Um, you know, so we have a full span of members whose service areas look incredibly different. So there's no one size fits all solution. However, I will say the tools, right? The, these digital tools and this digital layer is a universal solution for all these providers to deliver better outcomes for the communities, um, depending on what those specific goals are. Again, whether it's increasing safety, whether it's reducing emissions, or whether it might be um, providing more access or, or equitable access to um, transportation options. So thank you, Laura. E Egan, last, uh, last answer, last question. So you're not just a source of money, you're a source of ideas. So let's uh, say we're gonna reconvene this panel in four years and look backward, which one of your ideas that you're promoting at USDOT do you think will have brought the most positive change to our country? Uh, looking back over a four-year period uh, with a five-year bill in place, uh, it's uh, I think it's access to the bill funding to uh, address the issues that I just raised with uh, funding being spent on digital infrastructure to be able to capture what Laura is talking about, information that folks can use to make these decisions to solve their problems worth solving. Because at the end of the day, it's about uh, some previous uh, uh, spokesperson said, putting people first, really getting the information from the community on what they're trying to solve and then trying to address those needs. And I think the digital infrastructure element really uh, helps with identifying that problem to them in a way that uh, we can uh, actively address the need. So I'd, over the next four years, I'd look for uh, the uh, utilization of the bill funding uh, going towards uh, solving the digital infrastructure issues. Well, this is a great panel. We covered a lot of ground, a lot of hope for the future and the equity and, uh, and uh, sustainability. Vikram has made the most important point, though, which is he's going to get me to my, my office at Harvard more quickly and easier. So I uh, put everything in kind of a personal context. That's the one I heard at any rate. Thank you so much for your terrific contributions and from the questions from the audience. Thank you so much.